Well, <laughs> already not looking so great. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, got it. Uh, so on Monday, January 24th, uh, Burkina Faso experienced a coup. I don't know much about Burkina Faso, but I'm pretty sure I know more than the U.S. government that has dumped over the past 20 years, probably hundreds of millions of dollars and maybe a couple billions of dollars over 20 years into making the Burkina Faso problem worse. There's a great article uh, that I linked below. It's foreign policy. It's paywalled. But uh, if it's the only time you've clicked on a foreign policy story, you'll be able to be, probably be able to read it. And it talks about the fact that the folks who participated in uh, this uh, coup um, were trained by the U.S. government from a military that has benefited from 20 years now of uh, U.S. military involvement. Um, that's not saying it's a good military, um, as the foreign policy article points out. Um, it's quite haphazard. It does not have control of Burkina Faso. Um, it's, uh, it's a mess. Um, but uh, they are, have been built enough, up enough by U.S. funding to do a coup. Now, I think there's a there's a paranoid interpretation of this, which is this idea that, oh, my God, look, in Africa over the past 18 months, there have been six, six coups, all of which have some degree of involvement uh, from the U.S. government. Not that the U.S. government wants any of these things to happen, supposedly, um, but, you know, all of these folks have been trained by the United States, all of these folks um, have gotten uh, some kinds of uh, support, the militaries more broadly, not necessarily the personnel involved in each individual coup. Um, we've actually got, so it's actually six coups in five countries. We've got Mali, Chad, Guinea, Sudan, um, and now Burkina Faso, as well as some att attempted failed coups in other places. So the paranoid approach to all this is like, the U.S. government wants these governments to fall. The U.S. government likes likes military governments. And, and that's almost, that would almost be a more reassuring take on what's happening, this idea that there's some sinister U.S. government plan. It's, and no, no, the U.S. government doesn't care about these countries at all. If it were a country that, if we were talking about countries that were more wealthy, that had more resources, that were useful uh, to the U.S. government in some way, then actually someone in the U.S. government might care enough to do something sinister. The sad truth is that the lack of interest in the United States, in these countries, in the Sahel more generally, Burkina Faso is between Mali, a uh, country I've talked a bit about, and Ghana on the coast in West Africa. This, the Sahel, this sort of coast of the Sahara Desert, some of the poorest countries on the planet. The United States does not care about these countries at all. And the extent to which the United States does not care about these countries is, is, is testified by the fact that these countries have been entirely turned over to the Pentagon to do whatever they want with them for the past decade at least, and to some extent since 2001. So the core, the core U.S. interest in Burkina Faso and in most of the other countries of the Sahel is spending money on the U.S. military. This isn't war for oil. This isn't war against terrorism, despite the fact that it's sold that way constantly. It is war for war's sake. It is war to give the Pentagon something to do, to give suppliers to the Pentagon another place to sell things. And yes, of course, to the extent that they have any money, which is largely given to them for this purpose by the U.S. government, the local government's militaries are beefed up so they can buy things from U.S. suppliers. This is... This is, it's very sad to be in the Middle East uh, where, um, you know, the United States has a range of interests uh, that it has been carrying out very violently. But in some ways, it's even sadder to be uh, uh, from the Sahel, for, to, to live on sort of, you know, this, the south of the Sahara directly and have very little that is to very little that the rest of the world wants other than Pentagon contracts. And it is amazing the extent to which we are completely unaware of what the Pentagon has been doing here for the past uh, two decades. Um, famously, I believe it was, it was a 2018 or 2019 when four U.S. Special Forces were killed in Niger. The, the, the famous reaction from Lindsey Graham, supposedly a uh, Republican senator who cares a lot about foreign policy, his reaction was, I didn't know we had troops in Niger. 
And we just don't. The only news we get out of the Sahel is like every six months, um, uh, the Economist will do a lead saying like, oh, jihadists are, um, you know, Islamic State's really, really, really doing a lot in the Sahel. It's almost entirely generated by Pentagon press releases, um, you know, spreading jihadism in the Sahel. What's happening in these countries is uh, countries that had a lot of hope around the period of independence um, uh, uh, 60 years ago. Um, and I've been sort of disintegrating. Um, and then actually in the, towards the end of the 20th century and the first decade of this century, a lot of these countries started to build hope. You know, they started to rebuild themselves from the wreckage of imperialism. They were starting to piece themselves together um, and a big part of that process was a lunatic, but a very wealthy lunatic in Libya, um, Gaddafi. He was also a nasty imperialist in a lot of cases, but he also, in his latter sort of more West-friendly phase, um, was no longer trying to invade uh, places like Chad. He was actually just spreading Libya's oil wealth around. Um, and that made the first decade of the 21st century very help, uh, very hopeful for a lot of these countries. They didn't have a ton of state capacity, but they did have peace. The United States destroyed that. NATO destroyed that in 2011 by taking out Libya and um, uh, replacing a somewhat insane um, uh, but very wealthy and generous dictator with a civil war. Um, the, 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 the source of the most wealth for North Africa was crushed in 2011. And there is no capacity in the Pentagon um, or in the State Department anymore to rebuild these countries in any way other than giving them money for guns. And it has been a signal failure. It is true that uh, issues in these countries have just gotten worse and worse. Body counts have continued to rise. Um, it's only characterized in the U.S. press and by the Pentagon as jihadists, jihadists. Um, I think this foreign policy article does a pretty good job of pointing out that it's a hell of a lot more complex than that. There are ethnic tensions. There are um, just basic state failure tensions. Some of it is even uh, climate um, climate induced. Uh, the big from Nigeria. I don't know, is Nigeria technically the Sahel? Probably not because it's actually on the water, not not just on the Sahara. Um, but uh, from Nigeria, in this band from Nigeria across to Sudan, uh, the tension is between, um, it's, a, it's an age old tension that you know, sort of ended in Asia in the 1600s, um, Asia and Europe in the 1600s, so we don't think about it so much anymore, but it's a tension between agrarian and um, pastoral peoples, you know, folks who make their living uh, uh, you know, with uh, animals and folks who make their living by farming. It's these really basic, basic tensions that are portrayed by the US military and all of the Western press that just can't bother to actually send somebody there to actually learn anything are characterized as jihadism and rising terrorism. Because if you characterize it that way, you can get more military contracts. More military contracts to beef up militaries that carry out coups. More military contracts to send US special forces there and train people. And, kill random people, people who might have actually call, decided to call themselves jihadists because it made sense for whatever their um, ethnic or political agenda was um, to affiliate with something scary and abroad. Um, but a lot of folks who probably don't, the thing is we just don't know who US special forces are killing there. Um, are they actual jihadists? Are they a bunch of civilians? As we've learned recently in the Middle East, if you scrape the surface just a little bit, behind the Pentagon stories about who they're killing in Iraq and Syria, um, you find that it's mostly bullshit. There's nobody digging in to the Pentagon stories. Um, and again, this isn't some sinister plot. This isn't some incredible Machiavellian plan to bring about coups in countries that I bet most US senators could not name the capitals and leaders of. Um, no, it's not, it's not, there's nothing sinister here other than the same defense industry gravy train. We just want to keep spending money um, and clearly to no positive results. This is the outcome of 20 years of war on terror in the Sahel. Um, it's the outcome of 20 years of ignorance and greed on the part of the Pentagon and all of the contractors surrounding it. Um, it's just more death, more destruction and a bunch of countries that actually were somewhat promising 
um, in the first decade of this century, of this century um, finally um, being completely derailed um, by coups and destruction. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the coup in Burkina Faso, the um, sixth coup in the past 18 months in Burkina Faso and surrounding countries is very much the responsibility of the United States, not that we know or care, which makes me sad. Anyway, that's what I have to say about Burkina Faso. I'm totally, that's a good, eh, you know, I wish I could have bloviated for another, uh, for another couple minutes. That's only going to be a 10 minute YouTube, uh, YouTube clip, but you know, such is life. Um, so Mert Mufti says, Mali just kicked out the French ambassador as PNG, pers persona non grata. I do not know why that happened. Um, well, I mean, Mali is a place that is probably the worst, um, I think Mali has experienced five, sorry, not the worst, it is the worst abused. Mali, uh, I, I don't think it actually shares a direct border with uh, Libya, uh, it's embarrassing, but what it does uh, have share is uh, sort of desert pathways. Um, and Libya, uh, sorry, Mali, after the NATO destroyed Libya, Mali almost immediately uh, was destroyed. I remember in the in the first decade of the century, I, I had a, uh, a housemate sort of. He was the downstairs neighbor uh, who was uh, from Mali, and uh, you know his his stories about it, Mali at that point was a renowned for being peaceful and stable and you know poor, but fairly happy and on its way up. Um, Mali, since its independence in I was French, so that would have been 1960, I believe. Since in its independence in 1960, Mali has experienced three violent military coups. Sorry, has experienced five violent military coups. Three of the five that Mali has experienced have happened in the past 10 years since the NATO since NATO destroyed Libya. It was almost immediately after the destruction of Libya and its uh, uh, dissolving into a, a bunch of militia controlled areas. And so that was in the, I think Gaddafi was killed in fall of 2011. By the beginning of um, 2012, the renowned peaceful territory of Mali had been uh, overrun by um, probably uh, folks that Gaddafi had in, been employing um, with um, weapons that were, you know, used by the Libyan government and were now dispersing across the Sahel. Um, of course, the leadership of the jihadi uh, marketed um, folks taking over Mali. You know, they didn't come directly from Libya, but a lot of the people fighting there did. I do. I did look into Libya once, and it's interesting that the fo the guy, one of the guys in charge of one of the militias, you know, was a really fervent jihadist in 2012. But back in the like 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, he was actually like a fervent socialist. You know, revolutionaries will grab under uh, grab onto whatever um, it seems to be the current. Uh, revolutionary justification or ideology. But the reason that Mali fell into disaster in 2012, that's the most direct result of, um, uh, of NATO's destruction of Libya. Um, the sort of gravy train got rolling in 2012. This bunch of jihadists unleashed by France and the U.S.'s destruction of, um, of Libya uh, was defeated by French troops. It was seen as an early success, yay, uh, of uh, you know Western intervention uh, in stopping a horrific situation that had been created by Western intervention. Uh, so the French have been in Operation Barkhane. Um, it's not just the United States that has benefited, um, you know, sorry, it's not just the United States military and associated you know, uh, military contractors in the United States, it is also the French military and associated uh, French military contractors uh, that have benefited massively from the past decade of destruction. Operation Barkhane, I believe it's called, um, has been an ongoing failure um, in the Sahel for a pa the past decade now. Um, this is actually now being acknowledged by the French and US governments. I think it seems that um, even, um, you know, even those profiteer, profiteers and the French and U.S. governments can see what an incredibly humiliating failure this has been, or at least uh, it would be seen as a humiliating failure if anybody in the Western press was paying any attention at all. So France is looking for ways to get out of it um, and draw the U.S. in more. The U.S. isn't that interested in being drawn in more. Though actually, uh, in the new Biden administration, with its new uh, 
you know, they're out of Afghanistan, they're looking for something to do, it looks like actually, you know, Biden administration may be a little more interested in getting into the Sahel than um, than the Trump administration was. So that's an, you know, an ongoing uh, series of issues. But uh, with uh, the tension, uh, Malians are obviously really angry um, about um, how bad the past decade has been um, and the series of coups. Mali has, I believe, had two coups uh, in the past 18 months. Again, five coups since 1960. In 60 years, five coups, three of them have happened in the past decade. Um, this is what um, U.S. and French military help has brought. Um, this is what the destruction of Libya um, has, has brought um, to Mali. So uh, my understanding is that this latest coup, um, I think it was sort of the same constellation of guys who carried out both coups in Mali over the past 18 months. Um, one of their um, ideological justifications, uh, one that I, I guess I'm kind of sympathetic to, though I will never be somebody who supports military coups, is that the French have failed them and it's got an anti-French vibe to it. Um, so uh, this is something that you might have uh, heard about in the U.S. press because, uh, oh my God, there's a Russia angle? Um, so the Mali coup folks were talking about perhaps employing Wagner mercenaries um, to replace some of the French that are withdrawing. Um, and uh, I think maybe consciously uh, knew that that would create a tremendous tizzy. It has created a tremendous um, uh, diplomatic kerfluffle um, you know, the sort of uh, hashtag resistance neocons in the United States, all of a sudden, after, you know, contributing to the murder of Mali and the Sahel over the past decade, now they want to get very particular about, uh, you know, uh, what kind of choices uh, Malian governments can make uh, as far as employing Russians or, or what have you. Um, so, yeah, um, so that's the political controversy that's going on in Mali right now and uh, why the folks who carried out the coup uh, might have kicked out the French ambassador. So, yeah, that's, uh, it's a mess. Um, I don't think we'll fully comprehend the true extent of the effects of AFRICOM uh, until half a decade. Well, I mean, I I would argue we've actually got a pretty clear um, uh, picture of the impacts of AFRICOM at this point. AFRICOM was a... Um, uh, was established in 2008, um, and by 2011, it was destroying an African country, Libya, uh, that was the economic linchpin of the Sahel and North Africa. Um, and that destruction has had incredibly negative impacts, not just in the Sahel, but across North Africa as well. Tunisian democracy, something we talk a lot about on this channel that I cared a lot about, um, failed uh, on July 25th, uh, 2021, after... Uh, a solid decade of trying really, really hard uh, with multiple peaceful transitions of power. Um, Tunisian democracy had a lot of problems, don't get me wrong. But the fundamental one that they could not deal with was that the economic conditions in which the dictatorship before it um, existed were massively better than the ones that Tunisian democracy had to face with a civil war, an ongoing civil war in Libya the entire time that Tunisian democracy was att attempted. Um, and a um, uh, wars across the Sahel that the French and uh, the U.S. were doing nothing about other than profiting from. Um, so, yeah, that's what happened to the only uh, functioning Arab democracy this century. Um, so, yeah, we are I think we're pretty clear that the, the effects of AFRICOM have been massively negative. Um, and but thanks for bringing up that question, Logan, uh, because I think between Mert's question and Logan's question, I've got a good I'll have a good 16 minute clip that I can just upload tomorrow uh, condemning um, U.S. policy. Appreciate that. Um,